Today, we're going to be talking about prevention of heart disease, and we're very honored and pleased to have Dr. David Jones with us. He's with Arkansas Car Cardiology. Uh, Dr. Jones received his uh, undergraduate degree from Washington and Lee University. He earned his medical degree from UMAS in 2002. Following medical school, Dr. Jones completed his residency in internal medicine at Duke University uh, from 2002 to 2005, where he served as the assistant chief resident. He's pursued fellowships in general cardiology at the University of Virginia from 2005 and 2009. And after completing his cardiology fellowship, Dr. Jones uh, joined Arkansas Cardiology over at the Baptist campus in Med Towers II, I believe. Um, he's licensed and certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine in Cardiac Cardiovascular Disease. I present to you, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can, doesn't sound like, can you hear me? Is that working? Okay, great. Um, it's a great privilege to be here today. Um, is that, I've got some slides for everybody. While that, while that gets started, um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is the first time I've given this talk, and so if, if uh, any of it is not um, understandable, there we go. Uh, just stop me, raise your hand. I want this to be informal if we can. I, can you hear me? Does this, okay. Um, and uh, I want to have fun, and I want to teach you about prevention of heart disease and what you can do to never see me again. Uh, because if, if you are seeing me in the clinic or in the hospital, it's usually a bad thing. Um, and we, we generally, I, although, you know, I like my kids to go to college and, and have an education, I, I don't want it to be in a way that uh, would adversely affect you guys. So let's try and, and, and a lot of you are going to know everything that I'm saying. And I, I, I don't mean this to be too basic, but I think it is very important for everybody to understand the, the way that we prevent heart disease in America. The heart's a very complicated organ. Um, the, the way I think of the heart is there is, a, it's like a house in a way. It's electricity, it's plumbing, it has a pump, and it has valves. If you can remember those four things, that is the heart. Um, and, and I'm a plumber. My job is to keep arteries open. Um, there, there is a separate subspecialty of cardiology that is electricity, and we call them electricians, electrophysiologists. Um, and then we all kind of do the pump, uh, which is also thought of as congestive heart failure, uh, and, and the valves, which sometimes leak or block and have to be fixed. But the most common um, issue with the heart in America is blocked arteries. And that's heart attacks, and that's, uh, that can lead to heart failure and that is the most common cause of death in America, is heart attack and blocked heart arteries. I start with this slide um, because there's a big argument in the medical community as to which organ is the most important, and um, I um, am biased. Uh, but uh, the neurologists, the brain doctors, think that the brain is if you don't have a brain, you can't live. Uh, that's not true. You actually can be in a vegetative state and still have uh, organ function. Lungs, same way, you can be on a ventilator, but, but you can't live, um, y y but you can live with your lungs not working very well. If the heart stops, you die. And, uh, that, and, and that's one of the things that made me interested in, in cardiology. Same thing with kidneys, with dialysis, liver transplants. We can do heart transplants too, but uh, for the most part, the, the heart pumps the blood to all of these other organs, including itself. The, the heart arteries are not actually a um, don't start out in the heart. They start out in the aorta and are attached to the heart that way. And so that's important because as kids and, and as infants, we start out with heart arteries that are normal. They don't have plaque. Anybody know when the first signs of plaque start? Is it? So just show of hands. Um, 50s? 40s? 30s? 20s? It's actually teens. It's actually the teens. The, um, some of the autopsy studies from the Vietnam War 
showed that there were things called fatty streaks in the arteries of the soldiers. Um, and that's um, the fatty streak plaques that, that we see in teenagers and, and people, you know, 20s and 30s um, is likely from McDonald's and Wendy's and the, the food that we eat in, in society. The American diet is one of our greatest nemesis in, in uh, cardiology. Now, when, when those fatty streaks become plaques and those plaques become uh, big bulky plaques that then cause blockage to the arteries, the most important blockages that we see are in the heart and in the neck causing strokes. You also can have them in the kidney arteries, in the stomach arteries, in the legs, but the heart arteries and the uh, carotid arteries are the arteries that cause heart attack and stroke respectively. Okay, so um, it's probably easier to see on your slot on your handout, but um, this is a heart and the heart has three main arteries. Uh, most folks have three main arteries. One of them starts as, sorry, two of them start as one and then splits into two. And that's the left main coronary artery, which is right up here. It then splits into two, which is the left anterior descending artery, which is also called the Widowmaker. People have heard of the Widowmaker. Um, and then the left circumflex artery. And the one that comes off by itself is called the right coronary artery. When, the, when one of these arteries gets to a point where there is plaque, and that's usually cholesterol plaque, um, throughout it and it can block completely. That's a heart attack, right? And heart attacks are big deals. Um, and when, when the plaque gets so bad that it gets nearly obstructive, platelets start plugging there and you get a clot actually. And the clot can cause a big heart attack, which is a medical emergency. That's what you see the commercials about in the, uh, on the news uh, about people being rushed to the hospital with chest pain and taken immediately to the cath lab to have the, their arteries open. But uh, we, today, we are trying to prevent this. What we want to talk about is trying to prevent this specifically. So uh, anybody here, and I want to see a, a hand if, I, if, you, if, you, uh, if you don't have, don't know family member, friend with heart disease. Anybody? It's, it's all encompassing. It's, it's um, a uh, really, um, very, very uh, um, popular disease in, the, in this state specifically and, and in the country uh, altogether. There are three um, major risk factors that we can't do anything about. Nobody can get younger. Nobody can change, well, um, <laughs> physiologically you can't change your gender uh, in terms of your, your coronary risk. You can have, you know, but uh, men have a higher risk of heart disease than women. Um, but we're starting to see that women have uh, quite a bit of heart disease as well and have been underappreciated over the years. Uh, and then family history is a big deal. Everybody in, in this room, if, if you take nothing else from this, go home and ask your family. Anybody in your family, ha you know, mom, dad, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, really first degree. I'm not talking about Grandma Ann who is 96 and had her heart attack last year. I'm talking about Dad who had his heart attack and didn't tell anybody at, at 45. And, um, and Mom had her heart attack at 50. And um, you should know that. And if you, if you don't know your family history, please go and, and ask because these three things, as we get older, so age used to be about 55 that we started worrying about this. We're now seeing 30-year-olds with heart disease. I've got a, a stable of 30-plus-year-olds uh, 30, 30 who have heart disease. Um, in fact, I had a 31-year-old last week who had a, a huge heart attack. Um, obviously, men, we've already talked about, and uh, the family history. And really, we, we still say age 55 because anything over 55 is not premature coronary disease in this country. 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds are going to have fair amount of coronary disease in this country. And so anything less than 55 in, in your family, you need to be, recognize it, and it puts you in a different profile, risk profile, than others. And so what we can focus, we can't do anything about these. So we're going to focus on the modifiable risk factors, and that's the next 10 slides or so. And that's what we're going to spend the bulk of our time about today um, talking about. Thankfully, your lunches don't look like this. <laughs> Does anybody recognize, anybody had this for, for lunch or dinner recently? Uh, th this is, um, this was, so, so just for the, any, any police, peop, any police people in the, in the audience? Okay, I can't make, I, we can't do the rest of this talk because I stole all of these slides from the internet. They, they're copyrighted and I did not get permission for them. But I took this from Google 
This is a donut with an egg, uh, a fried egg on uh, under it with um, a couple of hamburger patties, bacon, uh, fries, and some kind of drizzle. Um, <laughs> and so th this is, um, I, I, do, I do clinic down in South Arkansas, and this is everybody's lunch in South Arkansas. And, and associated with it is some buttermilk and uh, a, a Coke. And um, so, and then there, there's cigarettes burning over here. So <laughs> we're, we're going to get to that. So um, th this is the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the reason I bring this up is um, it tastes good, but it's really bad for you. And it leads to ugly things. So if you can remember that, um, it looks like your lunches are fairly healthy. Um, I do want you to, uh, we're not going to go specifically into diet and, and certain parts of the diet, but I do want you to recognize that stuff like this is what keeps me in business. And um, that's not a good thing. Um, so, th 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 so everybody understand that the, the reason for this slide is cholesterol, fat and cholesterol in the diet, and that cholesterol is a big deal in our country. Um, and so my, the point of this slide is, is just what it says, know your number. And it really should say know your numbers. I want you to, so it used to be that total cholesterol was the big deal. Does, that, does anybody, everybody know total cholesterol, heard of it at least? Total cholesterol, met life from the 70s was anything under 200 is great. Anybody heard that? Okay. We no longer, as cardiologists and primary care doctors in the state, we no longer care about total cholesterol as much as we care about the bad cholesterol, which is LDL, and the good cholesterol, which is HDL. As part of your wellness program here, do you get your breakdown, your numbers? Everybody knows their HDL, their LDL. You know that it's good and bad. So some, maybe this is too basic. So um, triglycerides are uh, important, but not nearly as important as bad cholesterol. Bad cholesterol is the most important. If you have a, a very high, and, and so our goal for that, if you are non-diabetic and don't have prior coronary disease and don't have every risk factor, known to man, your goal LDL should be 100 or less. 100 or less. If you're diabetic or have coronary disease, if you've had a heart attack, if you've had a stent, your goal LDL should be less than 70. That's the current thinking, and the current thinking changes every couple of years, and we're going down. It's not getting higher. It's going down. We want it lower. Um, for HDL, the, um, it's different for men and women, but to be honest with you, it really doesn't, in my opinion, you want it as high as you can go without taking medicine for it. And so the way you get your HDL better is you exercise, you eat right, uh, you don't smoke. And if you like red wine, you drink a, a glass of red wine a night. But HDL for men should be over 40, for women should be over 45. Sorry, flip that. Yeah, no, that's right, 40 and 45, men and women. And then triglycerides less than 150. Everybody got that? Go home and look at your um, wellness packet if you, don't, if you don't remember your wellness numbers off the top of your head. LDL most important, HDL next. I see a lot of these. A lot, lot of guys that come in off the street who look a little frazzled, have never taken their blood pressure before, and it's off the, you know, off the chart. We can't even measure it. 250 over 120. 220 over 130. It's scary for patients. It's scary for doctors. Uh, most, most of the time it leads to heart attack and stroke. Everybody understand that high blood pressure is a major killer in this country. So what we're, what we're going to talk about is, number one, identify your blood pressure. You guys do that with your wellness, right? You do it, a couple, do you do it once a year? And we have a cuff here. And you have a cuff here that you can use if you are borderline. So our number is 140 over 90. Identify your number, 140 over 90. Systolic is the first number. Diastolic is the second number. Systolic less than 140. Uh, diastolic less than 90. African Americans are more likely to have diastolic hypertension than Caucasians. Caucasians are more likely to have systolic hypertension. Um, so who, who in here thinks that um, that bypass surgery saves lives? Hands, nobody? Does it, does, it, does it make you live longer? Yes, right, it's, that's easy. Does treating your blood pressure make you live longer? Yes, okay, it's, a lot of folks don't understand that and I think everybody here does. Uh, treating your blood pressure, if you have a blood pressure of 150 over 90 on repeated exams and your blood pressure is elevated, over a 10 year span, 
we can make you live longer by treating that down to 140 over 90. Okay? So you go to the doctor and, and they say it's borderline or it's, it's high. And most folks, and, and again, I think I'm dealing with a different population than what I see in clinic. But most folks say, I don't care. And you should care. 150 over 90 is important. Most folks that I see say, it's close. I don't want to take medicine. I don't want to change my diet, et cetera. So what leads to high blood pressure? Stress. <laughs> Not the first thing that I think of, but, um, it, but, but stre stress can, can raise your blood pressure. Yes. What's, what's the, the one thing that you eat that will raise your blood pressure? Salt. Yeah, salt is the big thing. So if you're borderline and you cut your salt out, you can, go, you can stay off medicine probably. Genetics, though, play a big role. Weight plays a big role. Uh, sleep apnea plays a big role if you're a big snorer. So those are things to think about when, 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 if you have a borderline or high blood pressure. And your primary care doctor can help you with that. But try and get under that, that 140 over 90. And don't be that 220 over 120 that I see all the time. Anybody, anybody seen this uh, on the internet? Uh, so I, I believe that this is, the, this is the kid whose dad got sent to jail because he was posting this uh, on, on the internet. This kid apparently is smoking a cigarette in, the, in, the, uh, in, in maybe two years old. I don't know. So um, the point of the, the point of the, and, and this is so, sort of funny and really tragic, to be honest with you. The reason I put this here is that this is when, it's not this age, but it's when we're teenagers that we get hooked. Anybody? Anybody in the room smoke? I, I, I probably shouldn't ask that question, but my dad smoked for, he started smoking, he's a, cardio, a retired cardiologist, started smoking before college and couldn't quit until he had his first heart attack as a cardiologist. So it just tells you the addiction, right? And then to have kids putting cigarettes in their mouth in their teenage years is what we fight every day. Um, the, 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 truly, the, the Little Rock population has grabbed a hold of that, and I don't see a lot of smokers in Little Rock. I see an awful lot of smokers outside of Little Rock who, who still smoke. Um, anybody grow up in a small town in Arkansas? A lot of friends smoke still? No? Good. A lot of ways to quit smoking. Um, the, uh, I don't ever tell a patient this, but the, 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 quote says, the quote says, I'm prescribing a patch to help you quit smoking. Wear it over your mouth. Um, you, could, you could probably say the same thing about the uh, obesity pills. Um, is I'm prescribing a patch to help you lose weight, um, put it over your mouth. Um, but the big thing is that if you smoke, we want you to quit smoking. Every, every half pack to a pack a, a, a day that you smoke, you increase your risk and you decrease your life length. Everybody knows that already. That's an old wives' tale, but it's true. We've got a lot of diabetics in this state, and um, the, the biggest obstacle that we have this, this far in the state is identifying patients, making them go to the doctor. And you guys are not the population, because I, I think you probably get glucose screening and hemoglobin A1Cs and the, et cetera. Um, the, the, the symptoms of diabetes, frequent urination, thirst all the time, drinking water all the time, um, blurred vision. Everybody heard those symptoms? Okay. Make sure you make sure you see your your primary care doctor once a year, and make sure you have a fasting glucose. And if it's if it's elevated, they'll have you uh, check a, a hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure from over three months. Okay. Questions about diabetes? Anybody? Everybody's aware of the the complications that diabetics have biggest biggest ones are on the left side um, although all of them affect the the, the person significantly um, stroke is a big deal in diabetics stroke and heart attack are the the two major killers in this country and diabetics have a very high proportion of the, those issues diabetics also go on to dialysis very you know more frequently than the regular population H high blood pressure and diabetes combined leads to dialysis in most of our patients who don't have some kind of genetic disorder. Um, you've seen the folks who have lost their legs. If it's not from you know, um, a recent war, it's usually from diabetes, okay? From a traumatic injury. If it's not from a traumatic injury, it's usually from diabetes. So 
Uh, neuropathy is the, the start of it. Neuropathy is where you don't have feeling in your foot or your leg. That leads to, um, and, and you, with, with that you also have blocked arteries down there that limit your blood supply. When you can't feel and you don't have blood supply, you get a nick in your foot, you step on something, you don't feel it, it gets a cut, starts, goes to an ulcer, it leads to an amputation. So uh, diabetes, uh, get your diabetes treated. And uh, the, the big, you know, the big risk factor for diabetes is what? Obesity. Other than family history, which family history and obesity are the two big things. If you have a family history of diabetes, you're much more likely to have diabetes. If you have, if you're overweight or ob and specifically obese, you're way more likely to have type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a separate, separate situation. I guess that's not really that funny, but I, I, I guess I thought it was uh, funny at the time. She's breaking the scale. Um, unfortunately, you know, I saw a 510-pound patient the other day in clinic who came in and asked me, Doctor, why am I short of breath? And um, I, I see him every six months, and I say to him every six months, please, and I'm not going to say his name, please go to the Baptist Weight Loss Center. They, they will help you lose weight. They'll get you started on all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, every time I see him, he can't get on the scales because he's too, too uh, heavy. And um, he is dying of um, his weight. So um, I, that, that's really not why I showed this slide. That, that patient's not why I showed this. That's not any of you. Um, but the, the, um, the point of this is obesity is an epidemic in our country. In our state specifically, we're one of the most overweight obese states in the country, I think behind Mississippi and maybe Alabama, but we're, we're awfully, um, and I don't like to use the word fat to be honest with you, but it's, in this situation it fits. Um, and if we could lose that weight by exercise and better diet and, and, and a weight loss program, uh, we could cut most of the preceding problems, diabetes, um, not smoking, but high blood pressure and high cholesterol, could, could almost cut it away. And I guess the last big risk factor that we're going to talk about right now is uh, physical inactivity. Uh, and this says, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? And um, I've brought this up to patients before who have had heart attacks, who continue to be overweight, who continue not to exercise. You know, 30 to 60, and I, I get no response. I bring, uh, you, you, would you rather die? And um, for whatever reason, denial is a very strong uh, uh, sentiment in our country and we like to say I've got other things that I need to do instead. I got, I got to go to work, pick up the kids, get the kids to bed, etc. But we, um, we sometimes overlook what is best for our bodies. So um, when we talk about physical inactivity, I'm not talking about this. I'm not talking about going and lifting the 500 pound, you know, going, going and lifting the 500 pound barbells. Talking about aerobic activity where you're running, walking, jogging, doing the bike, in the water, swimming 30 to 60 minutes a day, as many days a week as you can. Now, some people take that to extremes and you see them back and they're doing two hours a day, seven days a week, and they, they don't have any energy to do anything else. 30 to 60, three to five times a week is what we're looking for here. And uh, it's a hard thing to do. But it's, it's, uh, if you want to live a long time, it's the right thing to do. Not to mention the face that he's given us just really is pretty awful. <laughs> so just to summarize this portion of the talk, um, this slide is, is, is kind of the meat of that. And then we'll get into the symptoms and, and the treatment of heart disease. Um, number one, know your number. And, and know what your, specifically know what your LDL is. LDL is the biggest, um, the, the biggest, baddest thing that we know how to treat really well, other than high blood pressure. And in and, 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 and high blood pressure, we want your blood pressure less than 140 and less than 90. Not one or the other, okay? 140, 90. If you're diabetic uh, or have coronary disease, we're going to push those numbers lower, just like we do with the cholesterol, okay? So... <laughs> For diabetics and people with coronary disease, we want your, your systolic less than 130. We want your diastolic less than 85, and that's the current recommendation. Again, that will likely go down. So same thing with the HDL and the LDL. If you smoke, please quit. 
there are so everybody know the the we didn't talk about this at the time but everybody know the ways to quit there are patches there's gum and then there are medicines and then there's hypnotism and um, cold turkey and everything else none of which have necess necessarily none of them are wrong some are thought to be better than others so the pill has the pills the two pills that are out there for smoking um, have side effects uh, and people come to me and say I don't want to take the pill because I saw on the commercial that the side effect is suicidality and all this other stuff and I said well if you keep smoking you don't have to worry about suicide it, it's you're committing you know ho homicide yourself so um, so quit smoking if you can don't be so sweet um, di di uh, diabetes is a big killer in our state in our country uh, and then the exercise diet and weight loss any questions about that part I think we're f moving along so heart disease symptoms uh, everybody's heard the symptoms and probably some of you in the room have had these symptoms before and uh, we're going to talk about that so the early warning signs of a heart attack the classic classic signs are pressure pain in the center of the chest classically that comes on when you exert yourself goes away when you rest doesn't always happen that way that's what's called angina people have heard y'all heard of some folks call it angina but angina is uh, pain in the center of your chest and it doesn't have to be pain it can be pressure it can be tightness it can be a squeezing in the center of your chest that comes on with exercise goes away with rest some folks though have heart attacks with no preceding symptoms and that heart attack is not does not come on with exertion does not go away with rest it's a big deal it, it feels like an elephant sitting on your chest you can't breathe you get short of breath sweaty etc other folks will present and women typically present with different symptoms uh, diabetics also diabetics will often come in with no chest discomfort just a shortness of breath whether it's at at with exertion or at rest um, fainting sweating nausea pain in the shoulders pain in the neck pain in the jaw um, all signs and symptoms of heart disease all also fairly non-specific because you can have gallbladder disease that causes chest pain shoulder pain etc and you, you you know my my goal in, in in this talk is to make sure that you guys know what the symptoms are so that you can if you are ha if you have them in the future you don't delay treatment and I've got a couple of examples I've got a 31 year old I was told, told you all about 31 year old um, two weeks ago who um, 31 year old African American guy no family history no uh, not high, doesn't have high blood pressure doesn't have high cholesterol has been checked for all is a smoker um, and that's pretty much it and a month ago he had chest pain for 12 hours at a time that he thought was indigestion 31 if I had indigestion I probably would have done the same thing he sat at home through it uh, it went away after 12 hours it came back about a month later with the same 12 hours of chest pain he came into to the ER and he was having a huge heart attack huge heart attack went to the cath lab he had clot in you remember the the two arteries that split he had clot in the left main which is where where it is before it splits into two which is usually death he made it to the ER we got him through it we found out that he had a clotting disorder in his family and that um, that chest pain that he had been having over the last month was actually uh, a, cl uh, a hypercoagulable state a clot so that's not necessarily what most of us uh, as Americans are going to have but it was a warning sign that he ignored okay got a 52 year old uh, marathoner about three months ago is going to be on TV with me in a, in a week or so who uh, who runs all the time hikes runs uh, the guy can literally sprint up pinnacle I mean I, I couldn't make it uh, 200 yards he sprints the pinnacle he sprints down he sprints back up he just does it for cross training um, and was having an atypical kind of pressure in his chest um, that that was at the end of his exercise and he thought it was pleurisy he thought he was having just an irritation of his lungs came in three days after the severe episode started big heart attack um, I could tell you a hundred stories like it but um, I, I think that the point is if you're having symptoms we need to look at it you need to get in to see your primary care doctor if you're having the elephant on your chest do you go to the primary care doctor anybody where do you go ER, ER. good 
All right, so the diagnosis and workup of, um, of heart disease can be very complicated and can be very complex and can be very tricky. And so I wanted to at least just go over with you so that if you ever get into this situation, you'll feel more comfortable when you see your primary care doctor. So one of these guys is your primary care doctor. It doesn't matter which. And um, so um, what, what I'm urging you to do if you're having symptoms or even if you don't have symptoms and you want, to be, you want to be aggressive about your prevention, you go see your primary care doctor or you do your wellness here, which involves a blood pressure, cholesterol, um, occasionally and not all the time, an EKG. Um, and it, it, you wouldn't in the wellness because you wouldn't have anybody to read it. But if you're going to see a primary care doctor, they'll get an EKG um, and um, have you know be interpreted as normal or abnormal. And then if you're having, if you have enough risk factors, your primary care doctor is going to call a cardiologist to say, hey, I think he. And, and actually, some of the primary care doctors in town do the screening test, which is a treadmill stress test, which we'll talk about in a minute. Everybody heard of a stre treadmill stress test? So that's kind of our screening for, specifically for um, uh, decade screening. So 50, 60, 70 year olds who don't have heart disease, we do a lot, uh, the primary care doctors do a lot of screening tests, uh, treadmill stress tests, and EKGs for that matter. If you're having symptoms, you're probably gonna come to me quicker than if you're having no symptoms, you just need screening. Um, but the bottom line is see your primary care doctor, get your blood pressure, get your cholesterol, get an EKG if it's applicable, and if you're having symptoms, then we're gonna put you on a, a there, there are actually three ways, and we'll go over these, to, to, to work up heart disease. One is stress test, and one is called heart cath, also known as angiogram, also known as the dye test, also known as 10 other names, anybody heard of it? Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, and those, that's generally reserved for higher risk folks. Treadmill stress testing is not what this is. This is a guy on a treadmill who has hurdles that are gonna rotate. Uh, it, the, pe people think of stre stress tests when they come to my office and say, I don't, I don't wanna do a stress test. I'm terrified of it. I, don't, I, that's, um, I think they have this image in mind of something that is brutal and, 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 not, and, and archaic and we're mean people. Um, and this says, you'll probably find this considerably more strenuous than other treadmill tests you've taken. But in general, it's not. Most folks finish a treadmill with me, say I'm tired, but I'm not, uh, but I'm not, that was fine. Briefly, um, the, the treadmill stress test, if you're ever gonna have it, I just, just to prepare you, it goes higher and faster every three, three minutes. It is, um, they take blood pressure during it. There's an awful lot going on. We monitor your uh, blood pressure and your EKG during it. Um, but for the most part, it is a very innocuous test that you'll leave, if you do well on it, you'll leave and say, I'm glad I did that. It was not a big deal. Uh, I feel great. And I got reassured by my doctor that things look great. You don't ever want to be here. This is, this is um, as a plumber, this is how I make my living. Uh, and this is a heart cath lab. Um, this is a patient under here with a sterile drape. Uh, me, and this is not me, but this is off the internet again. But me and a tech looking at a camera back here uh, of the patient's heart arteries that are being taken uh, a picture of by this um, C-arm here, th this x-ray machine. It's a continuous x-ray, basically, of the dye going through your heart arteries. We usually put an IV in your leg. It can also be done through your wrist, run it into the heart, inject the dye into the heart arteries. Um, this is generally reserved for people with major heart attacks, mild to moderate heart attacks, or people who have very high risk um, stress tests or very high risk um, symptoms. If you have a, if you have a sim syndrome where you're having chest pain with exertion, goes away with rest, and you don't come to the doctor for a month and it gets to a point where you're having chest pain with minimal movement, you're gonna probably get a heart cath instead of a stress test. And, that's, and, and the point of this talk is prevention. This is not prevention. This is treatment. Same thing, and stress testing in a way can be prevention. So please never get here, uh, get to that point. Um, and this is just a picture off the internet of the, of, the, of the images that we see when we take pictures of your heart. It's the same thing that I showed you. Left main, left anterior descending, left circumflex. You don't need to know those names, but you just, you'll hear them throughout your life when you go to see your family members who say I had a stent put in my LAD, left anterior descending. 
I had bypass surgery because I had left main disease. Okay? So, uh, questions? The, you know, the reason I put this in here is there are a lot of places around the state uh, and a lot of places around the city that offer you a lot of tests, a lot of different tests. You can get this test or that test or the other test. And so this says, offhand, I'd say you're suffering from an arrow through your head, but just to play it safe, I'm ordering a bunch of tests. Um, and I think the, my point is you don't necessarily have to have all the different fancy tests. If you, get, if you have a primary care doctor that you like, who you trust, uh, who sends you to a heart doctor who you trust and like, uh, and you get a test that um, is a good test and reassures you, you don't have to go through the CAT scan of your heart arteries and the special C, you know, the high, high sensitivity CRPs that people are talking about in the news in terms of additions to cholesterol tests. And um, there, there, we could go through 100 examples of how people are doing more tests. Uh, but I think if you, if, you, if you have confidence in who you're dealing with, um, you won't have you won't go through all that testing unless they feel it's necessary. Some, and I'm, I think CTs are necessary in certain patients. I'm not saying that. Yes, sir. Smoking works in smokeless tobacco. I'm just going to repeat the question. Smoking is smoking worse than smokeless tobacco, uh, dipping or chewing? Um, the answer is yes, in, but in two parts. Um, yes, it is worse for heart disease. Smoking is worse for heart disease than smokeless tobacco because the, the, the danger in smoking has to do with the inhaled toxins that you get from the smoke. It's not necessarily the nicotine. That's the confusion people have is that nicotine is not great, but, it, but it's actually the inhaled toxins that, that are causing damage to your blood vessels and heart disease and stroke. So good question. Second part of that is um, there is a lot of risk with dip and chew and uh, snuff and et cetera in terms of oral cancer risk. So I don't want you to leave here and say the doctor said that I could go dip because I don't, you know, because I don't smoke. It's good. Uh, dipping is good for my heart, but um, it's, it's, it's bad for other parts of your body. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a, it, no, listen, uh, that's a great question because uh, folks who quit smoking generally gain weight, right? So you've got to train your brain uh, in two ways. You've got to train your brain to quit smoking and needing the, ad the addictive part of the nicotine. And then you've got to train your brain not to keep that habit of going to your mouth, which is how people usually gain the weight when they quit smoking is they eat more. And so I would say to you, uh, the most dangerous part, is, in my opinion, is smoking. So if, but I'm not, I can't recommend that you go to dipping. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I would, I, but I would, from a heart standpoint, I would prefer you to dip than to smoke if you want, if you want my honest opinion. Um, and then I, uh, I would, and that may make it easier from the um, habit standpoint to decrease your weight. There was, was there another question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And then later on in the report, it say, you know, maybe it was a large heart that no one knew about. It. Great question. What kind of tests, if you have a child playing sports, what should you be given? An echo test or, you know, a stress test? Or, you know, because it seems like all these people, they never knew anything until it was too late. Great question. So the question, I'll just repeat it in case somebody didn't hear it. The question has to do with um, athletes dying suddenly. And what is the best test or what is the best way to figure out if, a, 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 if you have a child or uh, who, ha, uh, who is playing sports. And so let me back up and give you um, a perspective here. Of the hundreds of thousands of kids who play sports, you hear about the one. So, and of that one, if you take the whole population, as a, the population as a whole, you're going to have way more than that who are dying of, of an enlarged heart than just the athlete. So it's not that they're playing sports that's causing it necessarily. So um, just I, I, I want to focus on you not taking your kid out of sports because you don't want him no, to die. Not, so, right. So we hear about it because Garrett Ekmans, who are great people who die suddenly when they're playing a video game on a Sunday morning and, and after a big game weekend, um, which is tragic. 
and and my I didn't take care of him, and I don't know the full story, but my understanding is that he had a dilated cardiomyopathy, which is an enlarged heart, which likely was a viral syndrome that um, we all get as you know in, in the winter time, and that he was one of the unfortunate ones that it it attacked his heart and made him weak. I don't know that for sure. I don't know any of the autopsy information. There are a multitude of possibilities that cause enlarged hearts that make people die. Uh, in young people, it's either hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which you hear about. Um, the guy, um, uh, when I was a kid, uh, was a basketball player for Loyola Marymount. Oh, Hank, yeah. no, uh, yeah. Hank Gathers. Yeah, Hank Gathers had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and died um, after uh, a game. Um, that's from a thickened heart that weakens over time, and that's picked up on routine screening EKGs. Now, your next question has to do with screening tests. Um, they've done studies on this, and doing an EKG even, which is fairly cheap, like $20, on every athlete is not indicated because it would so blow up our, uh, our health care budget that they don't feel that that's a necessity because of the sh small number of people that die. Doing an echocardiogram, which is way more expensive on everybody, is a mistake, unless you hear a murmur, unless you have some symptoms. And that doesn't help the folks who were very close to Garrett Ekman. But from a populational standpoint, that's got to be the recommendation. Um, I've seen a number of athletes since then who are worried about their health, and we do an echo because they have a symptom that they're worried about, and we'll do it. But um, if you're an asymptomatic athlete doing well, there's no, no recommendation for testing other than a routine physical um, before starting the, the competitive sport. That's kind of a downer. I, I'm sorry, that, that's a good question, though. Any other ones? Yeah, good question. Very good. Um, so the studies show that you can, and you can at least halt it from getting worse. Uh, sorry, the, the question... The, Sorry, the question was, can you reverse plaque buildup? And the answer is yes, uh, and again, two parts. You can absolutely halt it by changing your diet, exercising, et cetera. You can reverse it. The studies show, and we've done ultrasound studies um, of the coronary vessels that show that you can reverse the plaque buildup by cholesterol medicine called statins. There are certain types of... Um, you know, that. That I'm aware of, I'm not sure that there are any studies that show that just diet and exercise will necessarily reverse it. I know it will halt it. But um, if you've got plaque in your arteries um, by heart cath or um, some other mechanism and you don't take a cholesterol medicine, you better have a real good reason to. And, and, and by that, when I mean, I don't mean the 10, if somebody's ever had a heart cath and they said 10 or 20% uh, blockage, everybody's going to have that. But if you've got a significant blockage, 40, 50, 60, and you're not on cholesterol medicine, I think you should. That's my opinion. And I think that's the opinion of most folks in the country. Because it will, sh it will halt it at least and probably reverse it. But I'm assuming the reversal is not very quick. It takes a while. It it's, it's not like Drano. Everybody, everybody that comes to me wants the Drano. They, Doc, give me the, give me the liquid Drano that's going to that's gonna take care of this. And there's not, it's not that. It's from years of plaque buildup. Yes, ma'am. Plavix is a blood is a platelet agent. It's a it's a blood thinner. Although cardiologists would argue with me about that label, it's it's really a platelet agent that decreases the platelets' activity and decreases them from uh, decre um, reduces the risk of them clotting. You know how we talked about the the plaque that builds up and then the platelets come in and clot it. It it, it causes the platelets to be a little bit slipper, slipperier and 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 the blood to be a little bit more thin, even though it's not more thin. That makes sense, and so we use that in folks who have heart disease, blocked arteries, strokes, uh, stents, and so if you've had a, if you get a stent, you're going to be on Plavix or Brilenta or Effient, which are the two new drugs, um, for a period of time, usually a month to a year, but uh, but but usually now at least a year. Yeah, there. There, there, there are a couple of studies out there with Effian and Plavix that are looking at longer durations of both um, for 18 months to three years. And, and is that going to be beneficial or cost effective? That's a, that's a good thing. What about a CT scan? What's the purpose of that? 
purpose of that? What good, are you learning? Good question. So the question has to do with CT scans and the heart. And there are two major types of CT scans. One is a calcium score. Everybody heard of the calcium score? If you go to the heart hospital and you get the, the deluxe package, you're going to get the calcium score. And the calcium score has to do with how much calcium is in the vessel. And calcium has, um, is a surrogate for blockage, plaque. It's not a great one, though. The, they correlate fairly well. I don't order them because it gives uh, folks radiation to their chest. And I, I don't order them that, that often. I, you know, once in a blue moon. A lot of folks are getting them, though, in these lifeline screenings. They're getting the coronary calcium scans. And um, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with it. I just don't order it myself. Um, the second type of coronary CT is a coronary, uh, sorry, the second type of heart CT is a coronary CT where you can actually see the heart arteries. And it's similar to an angiogram like this. It, you can reconstruct it. Uh, and look at the arteries in, in two-dimensional. Um, and that is a more um, costly um, test than a coronary, coronary calcium scan. It also um, has a, lo uh, a lot of radiation. We're getting be better at it, but the ra amount of radiation, specifically for women, to the breasts is a, is a pretty big deal. And the lungs, for that matter. L lung cancer, breast cancer from radiation have been uh, are well described. So, but, but again, that's part of the other t t other test situation. You got to trust who you're dealing with, and, and whether you you think you need it. And, and and if you don't if you don't know why you're getting it, it's not something that we've talked about today. Ask the doctor why am I getting this, and they'll be able to give you a good answer. I think this is the end. Um, so I, I think um, the old saying is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think boy, I think if it's you and you're preventing it, and you never get to the, the need for a cure, it's way more than a pound. It's, it's a whole lifetime of satisfaction and lack of stress and uh, joy about not having heart disease, stroke, death. Same thing for your family. Uh, uh, as we talked about, know your risk factors and modify them. Don't just know them. We talked about that, when we but we also talked about you know, getting your LDL down below 100 if you're uh, if that's where it needs to be, get your blood pressure under 140 over 90, quit smoking, lose weight, exercise if you can. Um, I do think it's important to see a primary care doctor once a year for a physical. Um, they are the folks that I rely on to identify the risk factors. Coming, I'm happy to see folks primarily without referrals, but the primary care doctors are really good at it, and um, they do a little bit more encompassing testing in terms of all the other risk factors that are not heart related, cancer screening, et cetera, et cetera. You know, colonoscopies at 50, uh, mammograms at 40 for women, et cetera, et cetera. So see your primary care doctor and uh, he or she can start your risk factor treatment. If symptoms develop, seek a referral. And notice I didn't just say seek a referral. I think you, I mean, the, the one thing that, um, that, that is important to me is that you find a recommended cardiologist. And that recommended cardiologist comes from the people around you and from your primary care doctor. Um, and, and I don't think there are a lot of folks that are bad ar ar around this country, but I do think you want to be comfortable with them because it's going to be a lifelong bond if you have heart disease. And you want to be able to trust them. Um, if you have the elephant sitting on your chest, and you, even if you think it's... Um, even if you think it's reflux, but you have risk factors, you're of the right age, the 31-year-old kid really, other than smoking, really didn't have the risk factors, don't delay that trip. It's going to change your life. Either way, it's going to change your life. If you wait, it's going to really adversely change your life. I think that's it. Yes, ma'am. Very good question. The, qu the question, just to repeat it, um, does plaque in your mouth and gum affect heart disease? Is that your question? And the answer is um, we think so. And um, their periodontal disease is kind of gum disease that has to do with plaques and erosion of the gums. We do, there has been a, a pretty good association with poor dental hygiene and cor progression to coronary disease. Whether that's um, a, a correlated relationship, I don't know. I mean, so, some folks who don't take care of their gums are also the same folks that smoke, 
uh, eat poorly, don't exercise, et cetera. So it's, it's just because you have it doesn't mean that, just because you have bad gums and periodontal disease doesn't mean you're gonna have heart disease, but it does increase your risk. It's not on the top 10 though, in terms of, uh, of my talk, but great question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it can be a lot of things. So, so the question has to do with um, can you have sharp pain uh, right over the heart, which the heart kind of sits right there. Everybody know that. Um, the, the truth is um, the heart um, has nerves that, um, that are not necessarily, you, you don't feel, necessarily feel, like w when you cut your, cut your leg or bump your leg, you feel where you bumped your leg. With the heart, if you have an injury to your heart, it's called referred pain. You don't always feel it right there. Some folks have it to the shoulder, some folks have it to the jaw, some folks have that pressure in the center of the chest, some folks don't have symptoms at all. So if you have a symptom, you know, sharp pain uh, is not the classic story. A sharp stabbing pain is usually something else, muscles, bones, um, pleurisy, etc. I urge you to get it figured out though, rather than just um, take a blanket statement from me. Yes, sir. Great question. But the question has to do with baby aspirins after a certain age. Um, the, there are some new studies out there that, that um, are calling into question our use of aspirin. I'm still a big believer in aspirin, um, specifically, not necessarily for an age. So you go back to that slide that had age, gender, family history, and modifiable risk factors. Um, it's not just for age, though. If you're, if you're getting to an age where people have heart disease in your family, and you're, and, and you're say you're a man, and you've got the strong family history of, of heart disease, and then you've got some of the modifiable risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoker, then you're probably gonna, and I do that calculation in my head when I see folks in the clinic and recommend an aspirin. I'd recommend that you see a doc, your primary care doctor and ask him that question, but the answer in short is it's complicated. In, 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 a, in, in a bigger picture, I recommend it more than I think um, most primary care doctors because if you have a strong family history and you're 50 or, or, or right, getting near where your family had heart disease, you're a man, and you've got a couple of the other modifiables, it's, it's, it makes sense to me. The, the argue, argument against it is people will have GI bleeds or other things um, in the 30 years that you take aspirin before you have your heart attack. And is it worth having that, that problem from the aspirin? And the answer is, I'd rather have a GI bleed than die of a heart attack because I can stop the aspirin and the GI bleed goes away, but that's me. Yes, ma'am. I'm a big believer in, the question is, um, what, what is the story with fish oil? Uh, I'm a big believer in fish oil for, for two types of people. One is the person that has okay um, HDL and LDL, but has a real high triglycerides. Um, I'm a big believer in fish oil for, for um, high triglyceride patients. Um, and then I'm, in, I'm a, in favor of it for people that really can't take cholesterol medicine, can't take the statins, and need something to get their LDL down a little bit. It doesn't do much for LDL, but it's mainly for triglycerides, and it can help for uh, HDL. It's a good question. I, I don't, I'm not a believer in paying more for the fish oil um, than generic. So I, I usually say fish oil two grams twice a day. If you do more than that, you'll have cats following you around. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, so the question has to do with aspirin in, in the first sign of a heart attack. You see the Bayer commercials, they say take an aspirin, crush an, uh, a full aspirin. You, right, you don't take it, you actually chew it up and you let your gums and your mouth uh, absorb it. Um, at the first sign of a heart attack, I'm a big believer in that. Um, I don't know about the, I'm not a Bayer spokesperson, I'm not a spokesperson for anybody by the way, other than stealing the, the pictures off the internet, that's my only fault here. <laughs> but. Um, uh, but but uh, I do believe in taking an aspirin, first sign of heart attack, uh, getting to the ER, 
and then the crystal bare crystals I haven't read about or seen in a study. I just I've seen a commercial for it, so I don't know anything about. Also, I, I read where you, while you're waiting for the ambulance, you're not supposed to lay down. Uh, the question is, should you lay down when you, if, while you're waiting for the ambulance? I don't know if that's, I think that's more wives' tale slash fiction. Um, then, I mean, if, if you feel like you're going to pass out, don't stand up. Uh, <laughs> most, most folks that are having a big heart attack are not feeling good, so I, I think you can sit up or, uh, you know, I don't think there's any study that shows that you shouldn't lie down. Dark chocolate. My wife, my wife wants that question. The question is about dark chocolate. My wife eats it like it's um, uh, her only only food source. Um, yeah, th there are thought to be some uh, health benefits and heart benefits from dark chocolate. I, I would urge you not to go overboard. It's sort of like the red wine thing, in my opinion. It's you, you know one glass of red wine is great if you already drink. If you don't already drink or you have a problem with drinking. Don't, please don't start red wine. And uh, same thing for, for dark chocolate. Um, if you eat too much of it, you're going to get into a slippery slope of diabetes and sugar and fat and everything else. Is it true that grape juice has the same properties as far as the heart? It's a good question. Grape juice versus red wine. Uh, I do recommend grape juice to my patients who don't drink or who have a problem with alcohol. Uh, I don't know that there's a head-to-head co head comparison, so but I do recommend it. You guys have been great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Mm -hmm.